Attention all neurodivergents. Are you tired of feeling overwhelmed by loud noises and crowded environments? Well, D-Buds are a first of their kind game-changing earplugs with volume adjustable technology. D-Bud earplugs can help reduce sensory overload, help you focus and make your environment a lot more manageable. I've been using D-Buds the past few months now and they've really been amazing out and about at the gym and pretty much any time I'm not listening to music. If you're interested in giving them a go, my affiliate link is always down in the description. Use code 40 40 for a 20% discount. Good day and welcome back to the 40 40 podcast with your host, Mr. Thomas Henley, of course. Welcome back to the Autism Podcast and today We've got a bit bit of a special episode for you today, as as per usual. Uh, we're going to be talking all about autism and gaslighting. What the difference between unintentional and intentional gaslighting is, what the aspects that um, of gaslighting are, are quite um, ap- applicable to, to autistic people, like stereotyping, infantilization, some stuff about uh, why we may be more prone to gaslighting, as well as uh, what make crime is and what it looks like. And lastly, we're going to end up chatting about the different red and green flags that you can look for in romantic relationships or within friendships. So before I introduce my guest, I just want to give a little bit of a backstory. Um, I met Joely at um, the Autism Show in Manchester, I believe, and this, for anyone who doesn't know, is kind of like a, a speaking event where they have lots of different um, organizations who come and um, sort of demonstrate their, their products or like the services that they offer. Uh, but it's also an opportunity to hear from both experts as well as experts by experience, which is where me and Jolie came into to uh, chat about things. So, Jolie, how are you doing today? I'm very good, thank you. How are you? <laughs> Not too bad. It's as I said before. It's it's been a bit of a a crazy week. I was supporting a residential for disabled young people for about three days this week. So um, it was very lovely and rewarding, and I really enjoyed it. Also, my social battery is pretty much or has been pretty much flat for the past two days. So me too. It's starting to, <laughs> starting to climb back up. So Yay. I'm <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I've been at in Wales for conference and things, and I'm pretty exhausted too. But yeah, like you said, climbing up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you do a lot of um, public speaking then? I do. I travel. I'm well, a national and international public speaker. I do motivational speeches about mental health and autism, disability, and. Yeah, I try to empower understanding in a shame-free way of all of autism's hidden depths and quirks and the hardships that sometimes, you know, it's it's hard to miss. So, yeah, I really, I love what I do and it's so rewarding. So, how did you you get into, um, like, the world of public speaking? And is is that, do you do any stuff alongside that with, with your sort of career? Yeah, so... I started volunteering with a disability youth action team called the Chatterboxes and we sort of helped, we sort of designed like a magazine for other disabled people by disabled people and then we were like running workshops and as the charity grew, like my my career and my volunteering grew. So I started doing speeches at different events and then sort of from there it sort of snowballed. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I, I love what I do and I'm I'm just very very blessed and lucky that I'm able to do it (laughs) what did you um start off with doing like how like because I I know you mentioned about how you got into that area were you doing what were you doing beforehand and how did you kind of fall into such a well I I mean for, for a lot of people that I talk to they find it quite anxiety provoking to get up on stage or get in front of a an audience online and and chat yeah, so for me, 
I find it easier to talk in front of hundreds of people than I do talking one to one because I suppose one to one there's very much that to and fro and I find it really hard to like start or maintain or finish a conversation and because we're talking about something of interest to me (laughs) something that I'm passionate about I can talk about it and I don't seem like I have that many difficulties but in reality one-to-one conversation is a lot harder for me than it is talking about something I'm I've monologued and practiced Mm. to perfection like Mm. there's no interruptions there's nothing that will change and it's for me it's easier but yeah when I was at school I never could have imagined I'd ever be able to do anything like this like before I started volunteering I just I was at like an arts university and I didn't really know where I was going. Like I I sort of always knew I wanted to help people, but I didn't really know how I, especially as a disabled autistic person could do that. Like I've always loved my autism. I've always seen it as a gift, but it is a disability for me. It does. It's very hard. And I do have like 16 out of a hundred average life skills. So I did yeah. always wonder, like, how how do I make that dream of helping people a reality when I can't do basic things? <laughs> and yeah. it was, um, yeah, volunteering sort of showed me the way, really. It just sort of shone a light on all of those hidden skills and helped me understand the hardships enough to actually learn how to thrive with them and not in spite of mm. them. Mm. And I think that's the beautiful part of it. And I try to sort of convey that message in my own work as a speaker and fingers oh. crossed, <laughs> fingers crossed I, um, out. I relate quite a lot to the um the one-to-one kind of thing because I started with the own like my own online stuff through you know s- similar areas like I, I used to create videos on YouTube and then you know I think at one point I was I was kind of going through a very big like self-improvement journey and I wanted to improve how well I could talk to other people because I you know I I relate as well to you know being extremely quiet and nervous and shy particularly in secondary school um so when it, when I actually started the podcast my, my one of my goals was to become better at one-to-one conversation <laughs> so <laughs> We've got about we've got about uh, just over sixty episodes at the moment, so it's it seems to be going well. I think. I think. So. <laughs> um, look at, looking back on like my first episode, I think a lot of people will find it quite funny just to like see how different I am now to how I was. How much you've grown. <laughs> true. Yeah. True. <laughs> I also used to do way way much more editing than I do now, so I think that's a big factor. Mm. Um, so like when we were chatting before, um, in our pre-interview chat, we were talking about, um, a little bit about music therapy and a little, little bit about party and nightlife culture. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to, to t- tell us a little bit more about like the music therapy angle of things? <laughs> I can't remember exactly what, what we were saying about it. Okay. So I love music. <laughs> See, I'm... I don't know how to describe it, but I'm someone who can be both a sensory seeker and someone who's like sensory avoiding. So like, I love music and I can be at at a festival and I can be in a mosh pit and I can be dancing all night, listening to really loud music, you know. And other times I will need to just have absolute sensory calm and have no no sounds at all. But I think for me, in terms of music therapy, it's that obviously we like the music but it's also part of the stim dance you know Mm, mm. like you can systemize the data and it means the sensory seeking with that music and the movement as a part of these like mind wandering stimulations of how you process background information so (laughs) music therapy for me is not just therapeutic but it does help me process like problems in my life i'm going through in a background Mm. way without me over internalizing and shutting down and getting really anxious because yeah. I do get very anxious <laughs> I, I um I find specifically for me like a lot of the ways that music's helped me is it kind of well, it's kind of done it in a, in a lot of different ways like I think sometimes when you're alexithymic it can be quite 
difficult to understand what your emotional state is like. And I have lots and lots and lots of different playlists on my on my Spotify. <laughs> and I just I have I have some that are a bit more kind of kind of dancey and upbeat and I have some that are quite depressing and mm. sad. And <laughs> um a lot of the time I can sort of tell where my mood's at by how much I want like want to listen to a certain playlist. Which is strange. And then I guess at the same time, sometimes listening to that music um allows me to feel it a bit more and kind of process things a bit more that I'm feeling yeah I totally relate to that (laughs) absolutely and I'm quite sensitive as well so if I listen to like something really like I quite like metal sometimes but sometimes my sensitivity and I will just get Mm. really angry (laughs) for no reason even though I could be perfectly happy before I think it very much depends on my mood and what sort of sensitivities I'm feeling at the time yeah but if you listen to the right playlist, it really helps. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I uh, I have a very eclectic t- taste in music. Like um, I like uh, like uh, anything from electro swing to I like love electro swing, <laughs> yes. caravan palace, yeah, um, uh, B- BB Bella Bella do something mm. something like that. I can't remember the. Um, but then I listen to some like. Like American, like nineteen, I don't know what nineteen is, but <laughs> listen to some American swing and like oldie timey music. But then I listen to metal, listen mm-hmm. to like um, dark trap. I listen to a little bit of mainstream music. I'm I've I have a very wide like liking of things. The <laughs> the only thing that I don't tend to listen to is country. <laughs> yeah, same actually. Yeah. <laughs> I don't I don't know yeah. why. I think it's because of the instruments that they use. It just doesn't Sometimes it's a bit too I don't know how to twangy. describe twangy Yes. Or I was like... gonna say like pingy, but yeah, twangy yeah. is too I think it messes with my brain a bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't know why. Lots of different different notes that have different twangs. Well and... I think maybe that's the complication of noise that mm. I my brain can't handle it. Sure. Don't know. <laughs> I tell you what, well, um, you, you were saying about uh, sort of going to festivals and going to mosh pits and stuff, and like, <laughs> I mean, I, I I like music, but I don't tend to like going to see live music unless <laughs> I can like sit down. So I'd be interested to know what your experiences are like in in those kind of atmospheres <laughs> as a as an autistic person. So I adore festivals i oh gosh i i think i started going to festivals when i was like 12 or something like my first big festival was glastonbury and i went every year for like a decade or something very lucky because it's all so hard to get tickets but yeah and we we would just party all night and when i say party i'm not talking about drinking or or anything like that but like i would be dancing and listening to music all night because i I just felt so at peace in those situations. Like when I first walked past that pyramid stage, I was looking all around me and there's all these dancing strangers and like tutus and weird hats and Mm. stuff. And I was like, I'm at home. Like these people are just like me, a little bit strange, but absolutely owning it. And I just felt so at peace there. And I think the music and the mosh pits and things kind of made me feel at home too. But yeah, it's different for everyone. <laughs> yeah, um, I do like to, to to go out to the nightclubs now and again on occasion. Yeah. Um, just not not a lot as the time. I'm much more of a like plug in my headphones and listen to music on my own kind of person. Yeah, I used to go out a lot more, but I think I got old. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh. I think to to be honest, I would like to go out a bit more. I think it's more like, um, you you kind of it's uh it's hard to organize sometimes in in adult life. Like when you're just going like exiting from school, or you're just um at university. It's it's so much easier to like have those things just readily available. Just like oh, they're going out, they're going out. Oh, I can join them 
can join these people. Yeah, I um, could, I could never life. organize it on my yeah. own. <laughs> no, totally, yeah. totally. I'm the same. Well, um, I know that we're, we're, we're not here to talk about um, music and, and party life and stuff like that. We're here to talk about um, gaslighting, which I think is a is a term that perhaps many people will um, recognize or at least know know a certain amount about. <laughs> um, so I guess like that there are particularly two types of of gaslighting that that spring to mind: um, an unintentional and intentional gaslighting. So I, I'd really want to understand like what do those two types of, of things look like in in different in real life in different situations it's a very good question so for me i've been talking about gaslighting for like a decade now so i like to think i was talking about it before it became cool <laughs> yes <laughs> but, yeah. um gaslighting is a very very difficult topic to talk about because it is very complicated and I think there's many different types, but the two that I know most is unintentional and intentional. So generally, gaslighting is when someone manipulates us using psychological means into making mm. us doubt our own sanity, lived reality experiences or self and our memory mm. too. And we can people can gaslight us in numerous ways, like they can gaslight us intentionally with an intention to cause harm and gain control over us, or it can be unintentional where the intention, and this is where it gets complicated. The intention is sometimes to actually help us in particularly mm. if we are autistic. Yeah. Yeah. And if we are autistic, we can be gaslighted by anyone. You know, it can be our, our family, our friends, bosses, peers, teachers or doctors. And often it comes about because people just don't know how to help us because autism is so misunderstood. And it's an invisible disability a lot of the time. You can't see those hardships that we have. And there's always this ableist sort of perfection <laughs> obsessed society that's like everyone needs to act a certain way to be good. And there's all of these things. So people try to help us by making us change our perceptions of ourselves and our reality to mold us into what they think would help us. Yes. And it doesn't always work because it doesn't help us because they don't understand what will help us and they don't understand our hardships enough to know that these things really cannot <laughs> help us. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> so yeah. they're like, as you said, sort of the the intentional one is kind of it's used as a way to kind of manipulate people into um, feeling a certain way about certain things or feeling about feeling a certain way about themselves or their partner. Yeah. Um, I've, I've experienced um, intentional gaslighting before, um, which is, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of a tricky one because I think when we think of any kind of social, emotional, um, thing we we kind of like to think about it in in sort of like the moment or the the time at which it happens whereas a lot of the time these types of things tend to be very very like background and kind of just now and again and they just kind of like it's not processed yeah it's not it's not like you can say oh right you're gaslighting me, me yeah. now it's like it seems to be like a like a, a growing thing that just um, you don't really pick up on at, at the time, but when you look back on things, it's it's a lot more apparent. I think that's what makes us so vulnerable to it as well, because if we do, as autistic people, if we do pr struggle to process information and make connections like that, it does mean that what could be really obvious to other people is just not that apparent to us. Like I could, yeah. I could feel the rain on my skin and not process that it's raining. Like, I can't, sometimes I can't even process what my own name is if I'm really shut down. So if someone's treating me badly and they're taking advantage of me, like I, you know, for instance, if someone was to like move, like move my keys and then I, I'd be like, I know I left them on the table, but the person moved the keys and they're like, no, you definitely didn't leave it on the table. Yes, <laughs> or they take yeah. money out of your purse and be like, no, you never had that money to begin with. You're 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 not right in the head, sort of thing, and it's not yeah. it's not right. It's not 
it's it's not nice, but it does. It makes you doubt every every little fiber of your own self belief, and then it just snowballs into you just not really understanding or knowing or trusting any part of your own judgment until you're just. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how to explain it, but that processing well, what, um... is a big part of it. Because I, I think, you know, that that kind of intentional gaslighting is something that people can um, perhaps like un understand to a certain extent. But I think one one area that I I believe is, you know, it's a, it's a little bit harder to like for me to wrap my head, head around is like the unintentional aspect of it. Like, um, how does how does that happen? Like. In what kind of context would that would that be a thing? <laughs> so, like for autistic people in general, like what I was saying to do, with like trying to help us. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so, for example, people have, or society has an idea of how autistic people should behave, and they think that it will help us. So they think we should maybe stop stimming, you know, and they might say stop stimming, and stop stimming in itself is not unintentional gaslighting. But if you add on the psychological manipulation, which is stop stimming, there's no reason why you need to stim. It does not yeah. help you. And, you know, you can control it if you tried. That's the unintentional gaslighting. That's the psychological manipulation, because it's like, I mean, it does help me. That's why I'm doing yeah. it. It's not easy to control. That's why I'm doing it. Because believe yeah. me, I'd be masking it if I could. <laughs> and it does help me. And, you know, those judgments, you know, based on what society thinks would help us and also make us maybe easier to deal with to other people. So it's, so it's kind of like neglecting someone's like lived experience and perceptions just because you don't believe that that is something that people can yeah, yeah. That, that that is right like yes maybe if it's because our lived reality is so different like for other people like a hug might not burn them and they'd be like well, why are you having such why why not just hug them why not just shake their hands yeah you know and they might guess it's not a big issue it's not a big yes. issue to them because they've never experienced it they could never perceive mm. a reality different to their own and because they've been sort of taught by society what will help autistic people which is generally making us mask our autism, pretend that we're not autistic, mm. which of course doesn't help us in any way. <laughs> um, mm. They could use the psychological manipulation, the part of the gaslighting, which would be like, there's no reason why you don't hug people, that this feeling you have isn't real. There's, you know, it's impossible to feel it, that sort of thing. Yeah. And like, I used to get gaslighted unintentionally by like doctors and teachers for my shutdowns. Mm. And just as a background, <laughs> my shutdowns, I can lose the ability to walk and talk. And like I said earlier, sometimes I just, Same. I don't even, I can't even access my own name. Like I, I'm yeah. so yeah. shut down. I'm not the person I used to be. And when this would happen at school, it would be just, I'd be totally unable to do anything. But the doctors would be like, whoa. <laughs> It's all in your head. <laughs> it's yeah. all easily within your control if you wanted to change it. And it's yeah. an overreaction like that is impossible. So basically the fault is then with me for, for something that I cannot control. And yeah, it's, well, because, seems really it's because, weird because the lived because... reality is just so different. They could never perceive it to be real. And they Selective teach us that is to like make a... us be less autistic almost. Selective mutism definitely is a, a thing. And it yeah. happens. Like, Absolutely. For me, most of the time when I have a shutdown, I think that's that's a really difficult part because I think some people, you know, as you said, they don't really get it. And at the same time, like I think some people can have like personal like re reactions to like if if they've contributed towards you having a shutdown and you're not speaking to them <laughs> and you're not replying to them, they Thank can they can be like an air of like and not uh, being annoyed at you they can take not it being personally able to, taking it personally exactly mm. yeah yeah but the thing i like to sort of remember is that it is ga unintentional gaslighting is an intention to help 
So there is no shame when people want to mm. intentionally gaslight us because they are trying to help. They just don't know how to. And it's not really like, you know, parents and teachers will probably say this stuff to their children and their students all the time. You know, stop stimming, make eye contact, you know, with all the psychological manipulation that make people change their reality to actually do what they think would help them. And but it's not their fault that they sorry, that's not a word. <laughs> it's not their fault that they were taught by society of what a toxic way of what would actually help us. Mm. And I think as long as everyone is challenging themselves and in a healthy way and not invalidating, you know, their feelings, it's it's okay that we can all sort of keep growing together because it is a learning journey. Sure, sure. Well, there, there is, I suppose, um, an aspect of gaslighting that I think is very, just from my own personal experiences, but from, you know, just thinking about it, um, the aspects of stereotyping and infantilization. Do you have, do you have any, any experiences with do those I? two <laughs> or ways of, ways of explaining, explaining it that might be oh. helpful? Where do I start? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. I get infantilized a lot um, and it's because it's often because of my shutdowns and because sometimes it is stereotyped that autistic people aren't really adults, like autistic mm. adults aren't really adults and we're just really um, like children or, you know, whatever, which obviously is not the case. And I do get infantilized a lot, especially when I'm, cause I'm an ambulatory wheelchair user so I have a wheelchair, so especially when I'm in my wheelchair. <laughs> but like recently I went to get a vaccine and there was a nurse who, she infantilized me so much. She was, she made me, she treated me like I was an actual toddler. Like she was there like, oh, you're here for your ouchie vaccine. You don't know what a oh vaccine is, do you? Oh, I'll get, how about I give you a lolly? And I'm like, I don't want a lolly. <laughs> she was like how about i give you a treat you could have a sticker book and i was like oh my god did they know, like know that you were autistic the before they, they, the thing yeah. is she knew i was autistic but she was mm. treating me perfectly fine until the moment she knew i was autistic i was like oh so yeah hi i'm autistic so just yeah it just, tends to be that way doesn't what, it? that's <laughs> why i'm doing this but while i'm stimming i can still it's helping me focus on what you're saying and it's, you know, I just carry on, you know, I can understand what you're saying because I'm stimming. But then it was like a curtain dropped and she was like treating me like a baby all of a sudden. And it was, yeah, a massive example of infantilization. And I have to say, mm. it's not usually that bad. That's a very worst case scenario sort of thing. Most professionals know a lot better. But these things do happen because there's a very there's a big misconception of what it means when we are stimming. Like it can look childish to some people when we're stimming. Yeah. Like it can look like I we're playing. It, it's, or... <laughs> it's really interesting sort of like the dynamic between how we are when we like what people say about us when we're younger, as opposed to what people say about us when we're older. Like when we're younger, we're kind of characterized as this like little, little professor kind of, <laughs> you know, interesting child that doesn't seem to be able to communicate with people their own age and prefers to talk to adults and like, so sort of this kind of like old soul mentality <laughs> of, of, of what we're like. That was me. And then when, when we get older, it's like, it's the opposite. It's like, you know, I, I think I have been thinking about it a lot and I think it's a lot to do with, you know, just the fact that we, we don't necessarily apply ourselves to those social norms in at any age really and so our people always don't necessarily know where to put us um and when we don't fit those particular stereotypes of what adults should be like and what adults should say and what kind of um life um skills they have then the they kind of all automatically put us into this box of like, oh, they're not proper adult yet. They're immature. Like, <laughs> Yeah. And that's it, isn't it. It's like I'm still a capable, mature adult, even when I'm stimming. I'm still a capable, mature adult, even when I'm nonverbal. Mm. Like I can still, <laughs> I can still make choices. I can still, you know, I'm still an independent adult. Like, 
these things don't change just because I'm shut down or because I'm autistic. Hmm. Yeah. Especially if I've been empowered with one-to-one support to be independent. Hmm. Like I find Hmm. that interesting too, because it's um, people think that being dependent on care and support is like the opposite of independence. And I, I get that. I understand why, because on the face of it, that's exactly what it sounds like. But the definition of independence is to be outside of, or like outside of other people's control so that you can make your own choices. You can have your own freedom to do things. And I think with me in particular, like I have 16 out of a hundred average life skills. I need like a lot of life, life skills and self-care help and independence from carers and things. And but that care support helps me be independent and make those choices. And I would never be independent without it. Like I could never do anything like this. And I think part of that is that people look at autistic people and they think, oh, they infantilize us. And they're like, well, they need all of this care support. They're not independent adults. Whereas actually they could, if you empower us properly, we can still be independent it's just different to how society expects it to be yeah i think that that's that's a really good point it's um and also the idea of independence is very funny anyway because it's it's always it's never a black and white thing it's very much like a a gray sliding scale (laughs) kind of thing yeah like everyone's dependent on some human for for well, actually, for quite a lot of things in life, like the people who make all the furniture and the equipment that you have, the people who um, provide water and, mm. and take out the garbage and, you know, produce food that you can consume and it's sell the food effort, to you. <laughs> and, yeah. yeah, exactly. And, and with support, it's pretty much exactly the same thing. Like someone's providing you a service in order for you to you know, get, get, get through life a little bit easier or or be able to, I guess, reach a level where you're able to, to feel happy and, and, you know, fulfilled with your needs and stuff. Yeah. See, I see it like that. I see it as like everyone else is at like a baseline where they can thrive and be independent and disabled people, autistic people might be here and we just sort of need that little bit of extra help to get to that baseline. And that's all that care is. It helps us yeah. get to the same baseline as everyone else so that we can still thrive and be mm. independent and be mature adults. <laughs> and um, yeah, I forgot what I was going to say. Train of thought just disappeared. But. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There is an aspect of um, like, like, it's particularly the stereotyping thing that I feel has, be, has been the most harmful for me in relationships. Mm. And um, particularly stereotyping around competence in social situations and um, empathy, mm. which, you know, that that's something that, that I've experienced a lot about, you know, particularly um, intentional gaslighting about me lacking empathy or me not being able to understand um, particular social situations or perhaps situations within a friendship or a relationship. Yeah. Um, that seems to be something that's quite coherent with um, the type of gaslighting that, that, that I've experienced in life. Um, and it's, it's weird because, like, you know, you only have to, like, watch some of the content that I produce or the podcasts that I make to understand that, Very you know, I, I'm definitely not lacking. <laughs> I'm definitely not lacking in empathy. <laughs> And I'm not lacking in the ability to understand social contexts and situations. In fact, you know, I'd say that I probably am better that better at it than most net neurotypicals that I've come across. Um, but anyway, it's I feel I feel like that's that's quite a big thing because it's, it's like some people just have an inherent like superiority uh, over us, or or they they just they can't like. Um, accept that we're, we're mature, but, but we're just mature in a different way and that we do understand things, but we just navigate that in a different way. Yeah. 
it's, and also I feel part of my autism helps me sort of delve deep into the psychological details of like every person I meet. So yeah. whatever they do or say, like I've got this little psychological thing in my brain going, oh, I know why they're saying that. I know why they're doing that. <laughs> like I passed my child psychology NVQ4 at Cambridge University. I started wow. it at like seven in the morning and I finished it by like 10 at night. Like every module, every exam, like I passed it, aced it. And a lot of it, and the tutor sort of said it was because I, it was online, by the way, in a sure. sort of learning yeah. environment that suited me. <laughs> but the tutor said it was because she thought it was my autism that could help me dive in, dive into that psychological detail and work out. And she said, actually, like, you're more empathetic than maybe some neurotypical people are because you have been taught to sort of fight to understand people because you're always misunderstood and you're always people always claiming that you're misunderstanding them. So, and I think that's a big part of it. Like, like you, I'm, yeah. I'm hugely empathetic, like it, to the point that it hurts, but that empathy can also shut me down. So it can appear yeah. like I have no empathy. It can feel like it can look like I'm really cold or I'm not responding, but that's mm. because I'm so shut down with the emotional pain of it. Like my entire body will be on fire with like volcanoes. I'll be itchy everywhere. I'll be in mm. pain and it will shut me down and I don't know how to respond yeah. to those situations. Yeah. And like so I've, I've, often... I've been in those, sorry, I've been in those kind of situations where I've like had people tell me something that's really emotional mm. and, you know, I, I relate to what you're saying because I, like I, I, I make like less eye contact. I kind of look into the distance. I'm really trying to process and understand what someone's saying. Yeah. And some people take that as me not being interested and not being caring. Whereas I'm just really trying to understand where they're coming from and what they're experiencing. That's uh And also it's like it's partly like a defense mechanism because we've a lot of autistic people would have been told off and sort of shamed and invalidated and unintentionally gaslighted so often about not being empathetic and not reacting properly in certain yeah. social situations where like emotional values are really high and that can create this trauma defense mode where we're like actively hiding from it because our body already expects to be in trouble and we shut down mm. and for me i i soon learned like very quickly at a young age that i was the problem like I made that whatever emotional situation was going on, I made it worse. So I would run away and hide in like yeah. wherever it was, but I distanced myself from them because I believed and I truly believed this, that if I was out the way, their problem would go away. But mm. Mm. that just made it worse because they thought I didn't care and I had no empathy and I was just being selfish and that couldn't yeah. be further from the truth. And it's a huge stereotype, which again, has a big impact on the whole infertilization and also it links back into the unintentional gaslighting. Yeah. It makes makes relationships quite difficult. <laughs> it's putting it, putting it lightly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I think I think it's good that we, we've kind of chatted a lot about like what it can look like and perhaps a little bit more about the specifics of what it might look like for autistic people. Um, I suppose, like, do you have anything, any aspects um, that you think autistic people show that may, might make us a lot more prone to gaslighting? Hmm. This is my processing stim. <laughs> <laughs> Look a bit like Mr. Bird. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, yeah. Uh, <laughs> hmm, hmm, Smithers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, got it. So I think one of the main parts is obviously we're very vulnerable and we do misread situations and we do shut down. But also I think sure. it's partly how we process information. So I think autistic people process information in like a fact first manner. So everything is processed as a fact first. And then if we've got the capability, we then can process like the emotional the emotions and the memory and the logic that sort of ties in with that fact. So it's mm. for things like this, just as so it makes a bit more sense. Like if someone wants to say, oh, it's raining cats and dogs, like my, I will process that as fact. 
and be yeah. looking out the window for the cats and dogs because I haven't yet processed the logic and the emotional memories to be like, yeah. nah, that's not possible. <laughs> well, not anymore now that we don't have thatched roofs or whatever. But, um, <laughs> no. but I do think we do process things in a fact first manner. So, and the problem with that is that with these relationships, <laughs> Everyone around us is always right. Everyone else is the correct person. Everyone else is the wrong yeah. model. We're always taught to be invalidated and to yeah. sh be sh ashamed of who we are and that we should change no matter what. And part of it is also the justice seeking. We want to change and be good because that's part of our brain. Like mm. everything has to mm. be processed fact first as a justice sort of way. And this does mean that Anyone who wants to take advantage of us more or less can because we're processing their, their behavior and their mistreatment of us as a fact. This is something that should happen. Like, this is okay and I deserve it, but also I'm just as seeking to make it a reality. And mm. because we get shut down at the fact processing stage we don't always process the next bit with the emotions the logic and the memories of past experiences that could otherwise teach us that this fact isn't right yeah just i don't know if that makes sense it's kind of no, how no, it i makes sense. how i process yeah. it in my brain <laughs> no like, it's um mm. i think like the the way that i think about it's a bit bit kind of different like i i kind of i take on board what people say to me directly mm. and um i don't always like compare that to the way that they're saying the thing or the context of the situation mm. and if i'm in a relationship where i trust another person and i feel strongly towards another person um you know it's it's more likely that i'll take on board what what people tell me than than i won't mm. um there's been lots of situations as well from, um, you know, that happen to a lot of autistic people in terms of like um, bullying or, um, you know, uh, difficult situations at school and not, not, and having a lots of memories of not really understanding social situations and yeah. saying the right thing or, or doing the right thing with, within friendships and relationships and, and school life. And I think sometimes that, combination of us really focusing on the direct language it allows us to be manipulated a bit more easily yeah and at the same time like we're less likely to take what we think and, and what we feel as as seriously because of the, of the like the past bias the past kind of experiences that we've had we've been taught to validate every feeling or thought that we've ever had because we've always been taught yeah. they're wrong anyway so why would mm. we believe our own thoughts that are like, hey, this isn't right? <laughs> what you said was what I was trying to say. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think I think there's there's also the aspects of um, Alexa Fimea as well that can mm. make, can compl complicate things because, Definitely. like, if you say something and you 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 believe that it's right, like if someone sort of disregards that and and either intentionally or unintentionally gaslights you into thinking that it isn't um you know you, you don't necessarily have like the immediate emotional response of being able to like put a boundary in place and say like yeah. no don't tell me what i thought like i know what i thought like mm. <laughs> you don't necessarily have that and it's it's more of a thing where you kind of just go along with it and then you kind of think about it in a week or a few days mm. and you're like, hmm, you know, I did feel too good about that situation. I felt like they weren't really listening to me. And then you go back and <laughs> like flips over. Whoa. <laughs> that was so yep. loud. <laughs> Sorry. It's yeah, to totally true though, isn't it? It's no, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's, um, yeah. So, so, <laughs> well when you come back and when you try to approach something that that happened before that kind of seemed to be something that both parties agreed on people don't tend to respond very well to that so you know sometimes yeah. when you come back after a couple of days a few weeks and say like, actually hey this wasn't right and you know you try to put that boundary in place after the fact 
it's not always the easiest thing to do. Yeah. And it's, it's that background processing because it takes such a long time sometimes. Yeah. And I feel that's what I was sort of talking about earlier, that mind wandering stimulation, like music therapy and art therapy mm. and sort of daydreaming. It sort of helps us with those background processes. It's not always just problems that we're solving in like real time, but it can be the experiences that we had with relationships where we sort of, or social situations where we know something wasn't quite, quite right, but we don't yeah. have a quite process what it is and, what boundaries to set, if any. And it does, it takes a long time because there's always such, there's like a chronic overwhelm when you're all, you are autistic. Mm. It's complicated. Yeah, and it's not to mention like the mental health difficulties that we can have around anxiety. Like, oh my goodness. Anxiety <laughs> makes, you question, yes. makes you question yourself anyway. Yes. So it's when you're so anxious and when you're feeling down about yourself, you might be like depressed or something. Mm someone comes up to you and says that hey this isn't actually the reality of things you're more likely to go like yeah well, actually my head's all over the place i actually don't know um like i'm, I'm so dysregulated like i you know so it kind of i think that's another aspect that can make us feel a bit more or be, be a bit more vulnerable to that that thing it's so true because i'm always the first to be like oh no i'm 100 percent in the wrong <laughs> Yeah. Even if I probably wasn't and didn't have anything to do with me, I always assume that I'm the person who did the wrong thing and mm. said the wrong thing. And I will always be the one who agonize over it and try and work out why. And it will just stay with me for months, years, eternity, just always processing it. And that is partly why it makes me very vulnerable to this sort of mm. like the make crimes and the unintentional gaslighting because I can't well, always tell. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's that's an interesting part because I know that that make crime is something that a lot of autistic people might experience. Um, just to, just as a baseline for people who don't understand what make crime is, it's basically when an holistic or neurotypical individual um, befriends an autistic person or um, starts dating an autistic person with the intention of using and manipulating someone for money for you know any any kind of um romantic into intimacy type thing um or, or to do with giving them access to their property and and um their spaces and it's something that a lot of autistic people are quite can be quite vulnerable to to, to because of the the statistics around loneliness, isolation um, that a lot of us experience. So um, with that, I mean, do you have much experience with, with this, Jolie? Like, do you think that there's any aspect to, <laughs> yes. I guess, what, what, what we're talking about that make us, make us more vulnerable? Yeah, so, yeah. Mate crime is similar to a hate crime in that it's also illegal and it is punishable by the law, but it is something that's really hard to sort of pinpoint and actually take action because, well, it's complicated. So yeah. like a mate crime is the grooming of autistic, autistic or disabled, elderly, otherwise vulnerable people, befriending them with the intention of manipulating them for personal gain. And that can be like physical, sexual, emotional. You put it better than me. <laughs> 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 um but yeah and because it is complicated it's very difficult to spot but it's even harder to mm. report yeah so like yeah a mate could sort of borrow possessions and like never give them back or they could convince you to lend them money and they have no intention of paying you back they could you could be like oh i'm i've been paid and suddenly you're doing a pub crawl <laughs> and you're paying for everything because they conveniently forgot their purse or whatever or it could be yeah more sinister and the thing is it often starts small because they're testing your boundaries to how much mm. they can take advantage of you so it will seem like nothing's happening and then suddenly it's like they're taking advantage of you like maybe like not all cases but maybe with like sexual favors or they're moving a relationship on too quickly than than what is actually comfortable but they're sort of coercing and pressuring your consent to make you feel like it was actually your idea when it wasn't and because you yeah. know 
pressured consent is not true consent and coerced consent isn't consent. And it's very hard to process that when you're autistic and your consent is so routinely trampled anyway in terms of like unintentional gaslighting where we're taught to sort of mould our consent into whatever people see or see fit like yeah like I'm not consenting to masking all the time or making eye contact well I don't feel like I've got a choice and that's not true consent you know and it's a similar thing for make crime like I'm not I wouldn't ordinarily be consenting to this sort of treatment but I don't realize it's happening because it's Mm. so so slow and it builds up and also like you said the whole loneliness thing the isolation factor we are so happy to have friends like when it happened to me I was there like grinning all the time like I have friends finally why do I feel so alone so isolated why do I feel like I don't actually have any friends and it's because I didn't I was scared I was alone I was isolated but they trick you into thinking that actually this is the best thing ever and you'd be lost without them but of course you'd be much better off without them (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I've experienced it. <laughs> I tell the, the, the only, I, I think the, the way that I could probably add to that is it's always been things related to, to work for me, like with, with neurotypicals that I've worked with. Um, that, that tends, tends to be the case, but it, it's, it's never like, um, it doesn't tend to be like quite overt in that way. Um, it's, it tends to be, um, kind of, kind of like a lack of respect or a lack of respect of my autonomy where in, in relationships that, that have that, that aspect to it. Um, so I, I remember lots of, you know, times where I've, you know, put a lot of effort and a lot of time and a lot of everything into, into a certain Mm -hmm. project and, you know, um, they've kind of just kept expecting me to to put more and more of my time into it, and then when I kind of turn back and say, you know, this is, you know, you're not really respecting my time, and this wasn't agreed to, and things like that, they kind of brush it under the rug, um, or you know, they may not value ex- exactly and and take seriously any issues that I might have. Um, as it's, you know, something that some, you know, a, a, an autistic man who doesn't understand the situation is being like, uh, so I've, I've had that happen to me in that sense. And then perhaps, um, some instances where I was at school and people had befriended me or, um, got into a romantic relationship or not really. And, uh, just used me as kind of like a sense of humor like mm. to to make fun of and and that's part of it mm. like they all like mate mates <laughs> will often yeah. use your autism against you and they and they will take advantage of you they will push those boundaries and it will be for personal gain and that can also look like laughing at you because you're autistic and and mm. sort of putting you in those situations that make you like shut down or melt down and then they'll be like ha 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 look at the weird autistic person yeah and it's just it's not nice and that's often how it starts and if it's allowed to continue and sometimes it is because we don't realize it's happening which is so grateful to our friends (laughs) um yeah it can it can get worse it can get a lot worse hey up just popping on to say thank you for listening to this podcast this far if you could do me a real solid please make sure to rate the podcast if you're on a podcasting streaming service And do all that like, subscribe, comment stuff on YouTube. Damn, even send a heart in the comments if you don't feel like typing. Make sure to check out my link tree, which is always down below in the description. Or head over to my Instagram page at thomashenleyuk for daily blogs, podcast updates, and weekly lives. This podcast is sponsored by my favorite noise cancelling, noise reducing earbuds that you can adjust the volume on. Really, really great thing. They're called D-Buds, and you can find the affiliate link down in the description of this podcast. Anyway, I hope you enjoy the rest of the podcast. That's all from me. Well, um, we talked about kind of like 
gaslighting and why we may be a bit more prone to it, some of the things that I guess might be more applicable to autistic people, um, as well as talking a little bit about mate crime, which is, I think, something that uh, needs to be talked about a lot more. Um, and it's definitely reflective of the the negative experiences that we have with the world. You know, um, perhaps if we had a lot more of a good social emotional education for for us and also for our peers at school, then these types of things wouldn't happen so much. Um, and we had some good kind of post eighteen support, social support, and um, that would be something that I feel would help a lot in those situations or even just being aware of these kind of behaviors that that might that we might come across and that would be really valuable in in my opinion i need an actual I guess, checklist like, of it so i know it's going to be <laughs> <laughs> there's lots of things that we need to change um but i guess in terms of like the practical kind of takeaway things that we could um think about for for individuals who may be struggling to uh, i guess ident identify whether someone's um not being particularly good and upfront and um kind towards you and and what in situations where you know perhaps they are they are good for you and that stuff so it'd be good to talk about like the the red and kind of green flags for relationships and i do have some of my own but um i think it'd be cool to talk about the kind of like the red flags like what what um, red flags do you find um, <laughs> in relationships when when you just start them and how do, how do you go about identifying those I think yeah I think a big red flag like we mentioned is when they use your autism and your differences against you like their attitude might change really quickly and they will switch back to being nice with no effort if they think it will control you in a way that gets them what they want like they would be mean to control you to get what they want, but they would switch on the nice the moment they think you, you're you like threatening to leave or they think that they're gonna lose control of you. And if you leave, they lose, lose control of you. So they will switch on the charm and they will love bomb you until you're back in their arms, metaphorically or physically. And yeah, and you, but they will use that, your autism against you. So they could, <laughs> Yeah, they could put you in situations of like loud noises, even though they know that you're really struggling with sensory issues. And then they might blame you for the fallout or they might invalidate it or shame you. And if you ever made a little mistake or a misunderstanding in a social situation, they will never let you forget it. It will be brought up yeah. time and time again until yeah. for eternity. <laughs> and it will just... <laughs> If you needed help mm. with something and, you know, they're really great and they're really helpful, but, they, but they're they now holding it over your head mm. and mm. it's now sort of not a, what's the word, not a scapegoat. They're using it as a reason to coerce you into something else. Like I did this really yeah. helpful thing for you. You should do this for me. And that's not how consent works. <laughs> And it's also not very respectful of boundaries. So that's a big red flag too. I'd say that if I could add something that perhaps, um, you know, kind of one of the big red flags that, that has come up with any relationships, relationships that I've had that haven't been too good is that they kind of give, give an air of, of understanding about what autism is and, and what you experience without actually knowing or yeah. asking how, what you yeah. like and what, what you experience. It's kind of like, they feel like they've already understood the whole autism thing. They don't, you don't need, need to, to ask any more. questions. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it can often come across as quite like nice. You're like, Oh, Hey, this person understands me. I don't have to make any effort to help them understand, but it tends to be very like, stereotypical and it tends to be very like um yeah it's uh, well they're not they're not necessarily listening to to who you to are you. and what you experience they understand um, autism in general but they're not making any any effort to understand you as an individual and that is also a red flag yeah 100 yeah. um 
But even 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 just in general, I think, you know, if they're working like social care, or if they're like a teacher, or um, they work with uh, with charities, or they work for parents, and and they kind of they feel like they've got it all sussed out, and they just that they just don't have that kind of natural curiosity um, in who you are. I think that's that's definitely a red flag because you you are at risk of kind of being stereotyped by them. I think also a red flag could be when they sort of they put you on a pedestal and they think you're mm. so wonderful and you're perfect in every way and there can't be any conflicts, there can't be any, you know, they've rushed you off your feet and it's a whirlwind romance and everything's perfect and we should get married next week and all of that silly stuff. <laughs> but it's, um, you know, I think that's a red flag because, well, there's many reasons actually. If you're put on a pedestal, very much similar to what you were just saying, they have an idea of you and they're not willing to change it yeah. in favour yeah. of what their ego needs and what their wounded inner child needs from their past. They need to believe that you are the perfect person because they can't handle it if you're not. And that means that they're not actually listening to you. They're not understanding you. They're not, mm. they're not willing to admit that anything is wrong. And that also means that there's no conflict either. And I know that sounds strange, but every healthy relationship has conflict. There's always arguments. The difference is how we learn how to healthily argue <laughs> and communicate yeah. in a healthy way. So, like, if you're pretending there's no issues and that person's on a pedestal, you're just sweeping everything under the rug. You're mm. you're not listening to their needs. It's not it's not particularly healthy. And sometimes yeah. it's a defense mode. Like, we're so traumatized, maybe from past experiences, that we don't want to be hurt and we avoid the conflict. I mean, it makes sense. It's understandable. And, and some of these red flags can even be just shameless like some people have red flags because they don't they haven't been taught how to handle their their emotions and their trauma and communicate in a healthy way and that's not necessarily their fault so i think there's red flags for unhealthy relationships but there's also toxic <laughs> toxic red flags so this one has hope the red flags where people actively yeah. they want to try and improve they want and they're they're aware that there's a learning journey and they need to try and listen and communicate and health healthily learn how to improve but this one it's all about the intention this one the yeah. toxic traits they have no intention of improving they are literally just there to manipulate you and control you and to feeding their own ego so they can feel better about themselves and i think it's really important to establish which one is which <laughs> i i kind of feel like to, to a certain degree saying that autistic people are like perfect and these kind of angelic benevolent benevolent creatures like <laughs> um <laughs> i think i think i think to some degree like I understand that it's like a reactionary kind of approach to the ideas that that people have put up put out in the past about us being un unempathic and being, you know, perhaps not understanding in social situations and stuff. But it still is, to a certain degree, infantilizing. Um, and as you said, you know, if people have this kind of pedestalized idea about what you're like, and they don't really, I guess take on board what you what you say or aspects to your personality that are, are true to you um then at some point they're going to become like or how do you say um annoyed at you that you don't meet this this pedestalized it's, expectation it's impossible like, to realistically meet it no matter what you yeah. do because it's yeah. not real <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely yeah but also I think what you said about sort of the pedestal thing, a lot of people put autistic people on a pedestal in terms of like our savant abilities or whatever. Oh, yeah. And I think and I think that's got plays a part in it too. Because for so long autistic people were treated really badly. Mm. And, you know, we were dehumanized and we were invalidated. We were seen as worthless and barely even human. And that's yeah. horrific, horrific. 
And advocates like us in the past to be like, hey, autistic people are just like you, but they have gifts and they have quirks and they're servants and they have all of these wonderful good things about them. So humanize them. (laughs) You know, they're real, they're human. And I think that has held on to a lot of people today. Like they, and it's not their fault, it's just what society has taught them, but like, People also put autistic people on a pedestal. Like if they're not that savant, they're not real and they're not worthy of respect. And I think that's partly, I'm going off on a bit of a tangent here, sorry. (laughs) Um, But it's partly why I see my disability as a gift. Like I'm autistic, but I don't have any of these savant abilities. I'm not the person that (laughs) autistic advocates of the past would point to and Mm. be like, hey, this is... You know, I was diagnosed at two, like I didn't learn to speak until I was eight and all of this other stuff. Like I'm definitely autistic and my disability impacts me so severely. Like I can't always walk or talk and, you know, all these things. So then while that's really hard, that's the raw reality. It doesn't take away my humanity and it doesn't take away my quirks. It doesn't take away my me being a worthwhile, like a worthy person of good things. And I think we need to remove that pedestal because of that. Because we can still be, like, there's no reason aside from ableism why, in my eyes, why autism can't also be a disability and a gift. Yeah. And I think people, in order to learn to understand autism and autistic people better, especially in romantic relationships or at school, we do need to learn to understand those hidden depths and those hardships to be like, to humanize us and validate every part of what makes us tick so that we can be like, yes, we understand how to help them without unintentionally Mm -hmm. gaslighting them. And yeah, bit of a tangent. I think the train sort of went, (laughs) whoa, (laughs) sorry. Sorry. (laughs) I don't know if that was relevant. I think think, um, also a big, big red flag is um, probably aspects around expectations because um, if someone does something for you and then they expect you to be sort of amenable to what they want you to do or they expect you to repay the favor like every single time um you know that i feel like that's a red flag because in in you know life and in relationships you know as you were talking about um having 16 of the 106 life skills or something i can't remember <laughs> um like there's going to be undoubtedly some things that my partner will have to do in order to help help me with with my ne- what my needs are and i can i can help in in different other situations but i think when people have done things and then expected a specific way of behaving around them or a specific outcome that it's become difficult mm. um in that sense like it's almost like expected of me like i help you with this stuff so you do what i say or you do these things um you help me with this you know it's, and that not necessarily something that comes from me it's very manipulative and it's also yeah it pushes the boundaries doesn't it it sort of coerces mm. your consent because that expectation is that you've got to do the thing that they're asking you of you to do because they were like oh like I was so helpful and they use it against you and that can that sort of thing it can also like drive a wedge between like actual healthy members good people Mm. that you know like it can drive a wedge because they can see this these red flags and they try to communicate it with you and I suppose another red flag is that the person who's toxic will try to drive that wedge and they will make it bigger between you and the healthy people they will try to cut you off from your support network and gaslight you so that you believe that they're right, the toxic person's right, and the healthy people who are trying to help you, like genuinely trying to help you, they're wrong and they don't understand you and only only the toxic person understands you and that wedge gets even bigger. Mm. And especially when it's so obvious that all these red flags are happening and they're trying to help you, the wedge, it's like... A little ocean, you can't jump and swim back. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. No, I understand that. I think it's something that I've experienced as well. Um, you know, I, I would, I'd say that 
perhaps another aspect to it is if um, the person is very overwilling, almost to a point which it's crossing your boundaries yeah. to um, help you with life and things like you know perhaps coming around and supporting you when you haven't asked it or doing certain things for you when you when you haven't asked them to and you know like over over time sort of diminishing your ability to look after yourself because of you know they've filled in certain aspects to to your yeah. life and independent living that you yeah. feel okay with managing yourself but um they've kind of taken over everything and you know there's that kind of element of control on their part and if you if you say that it's not something that you want and something that it makes you feel bad and you you actually really want to do it yourself it's like oh well i've been helping you out that's a bit ungrateful and you know <laughs> relating a lot sorry <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> there's a certain amount of it's not quite but nearly learnt helplessness because they are doing everything for you all the time like they and they're controlling yeah. all the aspects that you think you could probably do but they're like nah like i'm gonna yeah. do it all for you and i guess they do and it. it's, partly, it's something that you didn't want them to do yes they then tell you oh. to do something that you don't want to do yeah it's really weird mm. and you kind of just go with it because it's just you know like well you i guess they did help me with this certain thing i probably should do that do i want to no did i want them to tell me in the first place no not really <laughs> and it seems I'm okay it i can seems, do that <laughs> it seems very innocent and that's the problem with red flags because a lot of it can seem really innocent and i suppose it's then delving into the psychological sort of the intention behind their behaviors and mm. sort of understanding that actions speak louder than words like apologizing well, that's, that's saying, hard, isn't it? oh it's so oh. difficult <laughs> but yeah like especially saying, when you're a direct yeah. communicator oh. just uh <laughs> it breaks your heart doesn't it just <laughs> it to does. realize that people are lying to you it's like straight to your face <laughs> yeah yeah yay autism <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's there's anything else. Um, I think I think those those are definitely the the ones that I would put forward because I I know you can you can think of like any we can think of loads and loads of different things that are probably not good ideas in relationships and you know probably could be considered not a positive sign but I think just by the nature of how relationships are it can always be very difficult to give those kind of definitive. It's ideas or so things. complicated because oh. <laughs> mm. working out the intentions behind all of these little things like it's a constant guessing game isn't it like it's and it takes so long to process and well life's very complicated in itself sometimes I'm overwhelmed with like a million things going on like I don't know my disability or my illness or like work or like just like with everyone like there's so much going on like the processing of healthy relationships and what's actually going on it sometimes it goes on the back burner because you're just trying to survive the day <laughs> which is trying to get yeah. through all of the stress and the strain of general adult living because being an adult is difficult <laughs> mm. <laughs> it's mm. never ending sure. but like honestly I wouldn't change it but Maybe that's part of it too, because like, if you feel like you want to change your partner, maybe that's a red flag too, in the sense that maybe they're not treating you right. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? No, I do. Yeah. Like, like get them to understand you better, mm. or to take you seriously. I think that could be something. Um, I think I think a lot of the things that we said, that I think they're very applicable to kind of the. <laughs> the like of the autistic experience of these red flags because yeah. i feel you know as i said we could talk about a lot of the different red flags and yeah. situations like you know someone who just lets you monologue and lets you tell them all of your intimate details about your life and then doesn't provide any of theirs or <laughs> you know doesn't put a boundary and say like you know it's this is not you know t this is too much for me or yeah. you know um so we could we could talk about like the the I guess the the normal red flags, but I think it would be really cool to talk about 
perhaps some of like the green flags of things to yeah. give a bit of a yeah. a contrast. <laughs> <laughs> do you know? Do you know of any any green flags in a in a potential um, <laughs> healthy friendship or relationship? So it's sort of um, spiraling from what I was saying earlier. Like if you think you want to change someone, I think also like the feelings inside that make you want to do that. So like if you've got, if you're calm inside, like there's no adrenaline. Do you know what I mean? Like the media has sort of twisted all of our perceptions and what healthy love looks like especially when you first meet and they're like oh you should have butterflies in your tummy you should feel all excited your heart should be pounding and I think actually that's not quite true I think if you have calmness inside and you feel at home and you feel safe with them then that's a far better response yeah (laughs) I think that I think that's a far better response because the butterflies and the heart thumping that's an adrenaline response that's your past self saying, "Hey, there's a, there's a warning," and you, you know your past self. I forgot what I was saying. <laughs> it's okay. No, no, I get, I get what you mean. It's um, I think, I think there, there is a very, there is a very heavy like, um, emphasis on like this kind of roller coaster of emotions and like adventure hot and cold st- st- start <laughs> start like style of communication yes or style of style of having a relationship which i i know it, it can be something that is exciting and it plays on your mind and you know it's up and down and it can be good and then it's bad and there's all these these different circumstances that really draw you into that person or that relationship and I think that's something that both men and women do or or non-binary individuals do it is something that I feel draws a lot of us in Mm. and I also think it's one of it's it's kind of this big kind of lie that our brain um enforces that if we don't feel that kind of somewhat strain or difficulty within a relationship then it's not worth pursuing or it's not it's not right or it doesn't feel right to like just feel like able to talk to someone and feel feel open to talk talk to somebody um you know it's 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 interesting i mean like people people nowadays they get <laughs> they get like turned off by people who are very direct in how they feel about people like how they feel about you and oh my gosh like, yes you know, I think you're nice and, and I just want to let you know I do like you and it would be cool to to do something. Like people don't like that. It's gotta be so this direct. kind of weird, <laughs> indirect like game that you've got to play of like, oh, I sort of <laughs> like you, but maybe not too much. You've got to <laughs> fight and you've gotta to, got to convince me and it's, But I um, think that's another really like a a there was so a green flag is that a relationship might actually feel boring because if you grew up associating love with like violence or shaming drama mm. arguments if even if there were good intentions and good efforts you know you grew up totally. learning how to love on that survival mode and you know mm. it's not your fault but it does mean that love that looks and feels calm that is direct and emotionally regulated can be so boring <laughs> that yeah. you confuse this as something bad because it's not matching the love that you are taught to be real. Think, you know, like extreme fighting and shouting, throwing objects, sudden declarations of hate and hating each other. It, you know, it can feel like passion and care, but because the emotions are so strong, but it's not real. Like extreme highs and lows of insecure relationships can bring excitement or feelings of passion. And, you know, it is easy to mistake those feelings. For the strength mm. of healthy love and that's that's the problem because being with someone who you can depend on someone who is straightforward and direct someone who you can trust with your whole being you know it, it will feel a bit boring at times because that unpredictability isn't there your adrenaline is not firing all over the place mm. you know wondering why you're walking on eggshells or whatever <laughs> like mm. Mm. and it's and so it's easy good. if you're not getting that in a in a healthy relationship to mm. be like Oh, I just go on, on online. I'll, I'll download an app. Like I'll go find this excitement somewhere else. So like it's just mm. it's such so, so, so much of an easier thing to do if you're not feeling 
stimulated enough in a in a relationship and yeah yeah people will find other ways to seek it out i guess yeah yeah it's it's funny because any and because i have quite a few like female friends and i i you know they tell me about like their dating life and relationships and stuff and almost always like if if they go with the people who don't kind of <laughs> provide them this kind of roller coaster of this <laughs> emotion and stuff they 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 actually find that over the long term it's a really sort of happy kind of fulfilling relationship it's yeah. not it's not like this crazy roller coaster kind of passionate journey yeah. but you know relationships are not not about that really it's it's about finding someone who meets your needs and is willing yeah. to compromise on your needs and you're willing to compromise on their needs it's like it's it's funny because like the idea of love it's very very much like a it's like a, a self-sacrificing kind of defeatist emotion <laughs> and like you know like you you know, love is best expressed when you are giving up uh, being around that person for that other person's own benefit. Like that's, <laughs> you know, it's it's got a completely feeling, you know, happy happy for the person and and having the best per that the person's best intentions are, mm. and it's not always conducive to 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 what a relationship is, which is, you know, it might might sound cold of me to say but it is like a it's you know you you are crafting something that's kind of like an agreement or like a <laughs> yeah somewhat set of rules and yeah. um, somewhat things that you help them with and things that you help them with uh, they help you with rather and i think part of it is also that um like the green flag that if things do go wrong you can, and even if there are some unhealthy little things that you might shout at each other or you might not listen mm. straight away, mm. but I think the green flag is the intention and the recovery afterwards. So, like, if you rec, if there's good intentions and you know, even though they're screaming at you, they still love you and they're still going to treat you kindly and they're still going to respect your boundaries, but also that recovery afterwards, you know, they're not going to sort of have such an ego or whatever that they don't apologize so you know that apology mm. will be sincere and they will mean it and they have all the good intentions there and also yeah. like you sort of said sort of spiraling off the excitement bit is that the emotional regulation also needs to be challenged too in the sense that the media has this idea of what love is people think that they need to meet someone and that person is going to fix all of their problems. Like that person is responsible for their happiness and their emotional yeah. growth. And that's not true. Like that's Two not what... Two halves of a whole. <laughs> yeah. And it's, um, and it's, you know, we need to, we need to look after our own emotional health and learn how to challenge ourselves and learn how to communicate properly so that, we can treat them better and they need to do the same so they can treat us better. And mm. it's both of us knowing that so that we can thrive. Mm. <laughs> I forgot what I was saying. No, 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 that's great. I, mean, <laughs> I, I would also add that, you know, that there are some key like personality kind of traits or, or ways of communicating that I think is yeah. helpful. There's a green flag in, in a relationship because so like uh, non-reactivity is one that I feel is quite important because it's one I'm really bad at, but I try. <laughs> neuro, <laughs> in any neurodiverse relationship, there will always be some element of miscommunication, mm. particularly when it comes to confrontational or emotional things. And if your first reaction is to blow everything out of proportion and like... You know, if 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 this person is someone to be like, oh, hey, actually, you know, did you mean that in that way, or you you kind of yes, could, yeah. you, could you explain that in a different way, or you know, there's there's less of that, the flip, the flicking the switch and just going, that's exactly like crazy, yeah. crazy at them. It's <laughs> like it's taking a step back and saying like, oh, actually, is this something that is just a miscommunication? And and quite often it is because you know, if someone 
two people have the best intentions for each other it's you know yeah me sorry have you finished my bad yeah yeah go for it sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, me a year ago not a year ago like a decade ago you know I argued completely differently and I would get very reactive and I would assume things that weren't right and you know I was young and I think we all do that to some extent Mm. and I think the main Mm. thing is that consciously like while you're in the midst of arguing you have to consciously be like this person might not intend the bad thing that I'm assuming I need to get their actual intentions to be like when you say this what do you actually mean and you need to like openly communicate and it's taking a breather so that you're not actually screaming at them and doing all of that emotional Mm. reactivity stuff. And I do think if you are very, if you understand, you know, your partner's good intentions Mm. and you validate them, it, it, what's it called, diffuses the tension and it makes, you know, because once you both feel heard and understood, you know, like that person's talking and you're not there sort of, boiling and sort of knowing exactly what you're going to say the moment they stop talking like they're talking you listen they stop talking you think of what you're going to say <laughs> yeah so that you know that it aligns with your values and what you love about your partner like and getting to that stage of not responding while they're talking not thinking of your answer you know and it's also it's like we need to sort of get out of the habit of fighting to win and fighting to prove a point. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And I think me a decade ago wasn't so good at that. And I think a lot of people, a lot of people are, no. though not many of us will admit it. And I think yeah. if there is that good intention that people want to grow, there is no shame in that because mm. we all have these trauma you know, defense modes from gaslighting, from being growing up and having to panic explain everything because you're autistic and no one understands what you're (laughs) anything about you. And, you know, and, you know, it's all understandable and there's no shame. I do think we do need to adapt to like a growth mindset where we are actively trying to step back, breathe, understand, then, then approach Mm. like rather than, ah, and sorry. And then <laughs> it's it's almost like, you know, it's it's definitely that aspect of non-reactivity and being able to talk about things and get over miscommunications is pretty much the make and break in a lot of friendships and relationships that I've had because it's it is a common thing. And and some people they do it right for a while and then they forget that you're autistic or they forget <laughs> that you you're different and you have different communication styles and then it becomes an issue and in times things, of high stress chisel. that that defense mechanism comes back and you end up going back to that self so it's a very mm. conscious very yeah. conscious decision every time something happens that you need to push back the defense mechanism not shaming yourself not shaming them i just realized i interrupted you i'm so sorry <laughs> no no it's fine um i was i think uh, another aspect for me would be um, you know, like we had that aspect where I was talking about, you know, just because they think that they understand autism isn't necessarily like a good thing. Um, if they haven't understood you personally, <laughs> I think having a natural curiosity in you or autism in general is all, always going to be good because there, there is a lot of, uh, there is a big communication and empathy barrier between <laughs> you and that person and if they have the curiosity to explore that with you i think that tends to be quite quite productive green flaggy kind of thing you know if they they're genuinely interested in what you're about and how you think and feel and perceive 100 percent open-mindedness i'd say it could, could also be part and part there like are they willing to take on board your experiences with with an open mind and not you know be, be able to kind of try and put themselves in your shoes <laughs> um and are you able to do that with them like i think that that's that, that could definitely be a green flag as well um i don't think there's anything else that i could could really say i mean if you just generally feel calm and, and then we feel quite stable um you don't need to be chasing this idea of happiness but 
if you are content and you're calm and you're stable and you feel valued and you feel like um sort of you you feel respected and you feel like um safe safe <laughs> yeah um i'd say that that's that's a pretty pretty good re- green flag yeah. although it can you know as we've said not always be the most exciting <laughs> passionate kind of adventure journey kind of thing um but who would want that it's exhausting <laughs> For you know, at some point you're gonna get exhausted by it and people do. It's like <laughs> <laughs> I suppose it's also like recognizing that no relationship is perfect and like comparison to other relationships will not help anyone. <laughs> if hmm. you're trying to be like a I don't know, a, a what are they called? It like an Instagram like model or whatever. If you're trying to be like their relationship, it's just it's only gonna cause more problems because again, it's that pedestal, isn't it? And you need to, yeah. you need to sort of have listen to your partner's boundaries and understand their mm. story and like what you were just saying. You need to learn about them and want, to, like, you can't have an Instagrammer's wedding or whatever because it has nothing to do with you and your partner. Like, you have to. Well, it's it's, it's, it's always it's, like tailored and yeah. it's like the whole thing about you know you don't see the athletes in training you and you see them on the podium. Yeah. You know, it's you true. don't see their failures, you just see the success that they had, you know. so And that's a really good point because every failure can help you learn how to grow together if it's a healthy relationship with good mm. intentions. Because a lot of relationships will be a little bit red flaggy and it does make it complicated. But if you can ascertain the intention behind, behind it, like we were talking mm. about. Oh my gosh, I totally forgot what I was saying. No, what no, were, I, I what understand what saying? you mean. It's what were you saying? Having, having I, think, I think the difficulty for me is like the intention can be like hard to figure out sometimes when you're autistic. I <laughs> guess uh, so people can difficult. say what their intentions are, but <laughs> you know, as you said, like as much as you can, you have to look at the long run. Like you have to look at situations or relationships and kind of like a zoomed out approach. Like as these perhaps red flaggy toxic behaviors mm. just kind of a drop in the ocean or do they do they seem to be like like um existent at many sort of different parts during yeah. the relationship or how you know, often how often is your adrenaline firing up how often are you feeling like sick or jittery yeah. or in pain or poorly like it's all part and parcel of it sometimes even when you your emotions don't know or your mind might not know but your body might and listening to your body is a very good way to ascertain those red flags because if something's not feeling right and you feel disrespected your body will tell you <laughs> it's true it's true or, or a case if you're like Sophia, it might tell you a few days or a, or a week or so <laughs> <Yeah>. later. <laughs> I was about to say that. <laughs> Making that connection. And then you can have the fun conversation <laughs> where you, you send a long, 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 long message after <laughs> saying that it's okay, that it's actually not okay, <laughs> which is always fun. Um, if you relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Well, it's been been really great to to talk about these things, and I feel like we've we've gone over a lot of both personal and um, informational based things. And hopefully, for anyone listening, they will have a bit more of an idea of what to look for and what to avoid, and you know, finding a healthy kind of stable relationship as as an autistic person. Um, as I said, and I have as we have said throughout, this is not like a, a wholesome a holistic guide to everything to do with relationships. A lot of the times it's very individual. It's very transient. It's hard to pick up on. It's not necessarily something. And, you know, usually the best way to um, understand it is to, to, to work for it with, with a professional or, or someone who has, um, who can actually talk to you about your individual experiences. Um, but I think, I feel like we've gone through some, some good stuff, Julie. <laughs> good <laughs> well um do you have you know we're kind, of, we're kind of rounding up at the end of the podcast now um do you have any uh 
like social medias, links, websites, uh, oh. things that people can go to? Um, so I do know the answer, I promise. Um, <laughs> me accessing the answer. Um, <laughs> yes. It's been a long part. We've been chatting for like an hour and a half and the the half an hour before that we were trying to set <laughs> off the the audio so i i it's you know my brain is is also a bit fried at the moment so <laughs> so it's... yeah okay i got it <laughs> <laughs> i am my autistic wings so you can find me on www.myautisticwings.co.uk uh m y oh gosh how do you spell it m y a u t i s t i c w i n g s I hope I spelled that right. <laughs> I'm usually really well, good at spelling. It will, it will be down in the description. So, um, you know, I think we'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you can find me. Um, I'm publishing a book later this year. And actually a lot mm. of what we talked about today, I wrote a whole chapter on relationships and sort of the societal and people's impact on autistic people. And sure. yeah. What's your, what's your book called? Uh, my autistic wings oh <laughs> uh, yeah it's on brands you got it <laughs> yeah it's it's all about um it's an empowering and educational autism resource book partly autobiographical and very cool yeah it's a sort of the follow-up from my first book asperge world which was all about childhood to teenagers and this one is teenage to adulthood sort of the transitions mm. independence training work and career and lots of funny little stories and me being a bit strange <laughs> um yeah I'm really I'm so excited I'm so looking forward to it like I was really blessed that my first book helped so many people and I was you know that was my dream that was one of the first things you asked me you know what did you do before you started speaking and that's what I was doing I was writing my book I was writing my book <laughs> I was diagnosed at aut as autistic at two years old but I found out when I was 13 because that's when I processed I was different to other mm. people. And when my parents told me at 13 years old, I read every book out there and there was nothing from a female perspective that was positive. It was, mm. that was empowering. Mm. And I basically wrote the book that I desperately needed. And I've done the same again <laughs> for the second book. So fingers crossed it helps people because like, you know, that's my dream. <laughs> that's my dream. Yeah. I awesome. <laughs> Awesome. And uh, if you have enjoyed this um, episode of the 4GOT podcast, make sure to like, subscribe, um, rate it. If you could be so kind over on any of the podcasting streaming services. Uh, if you want to check out some more stuff about um, how my life is going, the things that I get <laughs> up to, maybe you want to check out my daily blogs over on Instagram. That is uh, at Thomas Hanley UK. And if you want to get in touch, there is always a link tree down below with all of my links, um, podcast clips, coaching, um, my website, things like that. They're all down there. So, um, yeah. Jolie, do you, um, have a song of the day? Do you have a, a song that, <laughs> that, that means something to you that you could, um, that you could give that, that, that either means something related to the podcast or something that. I feel um, really you particularly like at the moment. Oh my goodness, I feel really daft because I prepped for this for this interview a lot and I've got pages of notes in front of me. I kind of forgot about the song. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. I think you might have, you I, might have put I'm it in I'm a your huge huge music lover, calendar. but like I find it so hard to just pick one one, one song. song. One song. But at the moment I am really liking um, Madeline Bailey's cover of Flowers by Miley Cyrus, which is unusual because I don't usually like that sort of pop music, but I like Madeline Bailey's covers of things. So, so Madeline Bailey's... That's kind of on topic because it's about relationships, I guess. <laughs> Madeline Bailey's. She's a very pretty lady. She's really nice, yeah. Awesome. That is added to the 40 Orty Song of the Day playlist, which is always <laughs> down in the description, right at the bottom if you want to go check that out. And um, I've got one last question for you, Jolie. Have you enjoyed your 40 audio experience? I have. It's been brilliant. 
it's really good to um, discuss these things and with another like-minded person, which doesn't happen often. <laughs> so yeah, I've had a great time. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's been an honour. Awesome. <laughs> Well, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on, Julie. After after so long, I think it was. It's been like a few years, a couple of years since we first met each other, and we're only just getting into to doing the episode. So it's I think cool. It was it's good. June or something. I don't... Yeah. <laughs> I've been quite awesome. shut down. <laughs> well, um, I'm gonna do like an outro sequence, and just don't click off the call because the. Um, it has to like process and stuff at the end. So when we say bye, don't click off. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so someone's done that before, and it's it's like really like, nerve recording. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can you say in the chat when I can click off? Would that help? Oh no, I'll I'll end the recording and then okay. <laughs> and then we can chat and I'll let you know when it's done. So I hope you have enjoyed this episode of the 40 OD podcast. Make sure to tune in next week where we talk about another autism neurodiversity related subject. Um, usually Monday, 1 p.m. over on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and about 5 p.m. over on YouTube. So hope you have a good day. Hope you have a good week and I'll see you in another episode of the 40 OD podcast. <laughs> see you later, guys.